Dr. Dan Bahat was a mere infant in 1938 when his parents fled Poland for Palestine and settled in Tel Aviv. In his teens, he thought of becoming a classical pianist. But after exploring the mountains and ancient ruins, his thoughts changed. And so began an unusually distinguished career. Dr. Bahat was the senior lecturer at Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel, and the former district archaeologist of Jerusalem. Currently, he is lecturer at St. Michael's College at University of Toronto. Dr. Bahat is considered the authority on the history and archaeology of the city of Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dan Bahat. Good evening. Uh, this is the third lecture, and uh, to my opinion, the most interesting one, because if I speak about the Temple Mount, <laughs> I think there is no other place which is so interesting as the Temple Mount. The lecture is actually should be based on the Western Wall. This is the idea of the Kotel, as we call it in Hebrew, as you know. But of course, I cannot do it in order to explain the history of the Kotel. I cannot refrain from talking about the Temple Mount and explain the importance. How come the, the Western Wall is, uh, became holy? I must tell you, um, in the last 30 years, I've been working, digging the Western Wall Tunnel, which I think some of you have been to Israel, must have visited, because it becomes today site number two in Israel, after Masada and uh, the Israel, Israel uh, Museum in Jerusalem. And um, I'm very proud of that work. Only a few weeks ago, when I was already here in Toronto, my big book on the excavations, the, and the result of which, uh, the pro, some historical problems such as since when Jews are praying at the Western Wall. I don't know if anybody knows. All those kind of things came out as a result of the excavations along the Western Wall. And this is what I'm going to talk about. But as I said, I must start speak about the Temple Mount altogether. I was asked to be, speak slower because my Hebrew accent is not so good for many listeners who are afraid I'm speaking too, long, too fast. So I'll try to speak slowly, but I know that with enthusiasm later it will be fast again, so get used to it. <laughs> At any rate, the first picture which you see is uh, Jerusalem. Uh, I took on purpose this picture uh, early in the morning in order to emphasize, oh, sorry, I forgot, uh, yes, in order to emphasize the central valley of Jerusalem, which you see, you can follow it, going down all the way down to the Pool of Siloam, leaving this, separating the city of David from Mount Zion. Why is this one so important? Because when you see the Temple Mount today, all the four walls which you see of the Temple Mount are actually from the time of Herod the Great. Now, the western wall, of which the Praying Plaza is only one-ninth, one-ninth of the entire western wall, is actually the retaining wall of the Temple Mount against the valley, the central valley of Jerusalem. This valley is called by Josephus Flavius, it is called the Tiropion Valley, which means the Cheesemakers Valley, but of course it is not what it was really in Hebrew. We don't know the Hebrew name of it, but Josephus Flavius, in order to adjust the names in Jerusalem or in the country altogether to the Greek ear, he sometimes made all kinds of false translations so that people will remember the name in Greek, but it is definitely nothing to do. There were no cheese in Jerusalem of which we know it all. Probably the name comes from the Hebrew word of Tzorfim, which means a blacksmith or goldsmith or silversmith. Maybe much more logical than cheese makers, but still it is a problem to which I don't have an answer. The Temple Mount today is busy with two, occupied rather, by two structures. One of them is the Dome of the Rock, and one of them is the Aksa Mosque. The important of the two is, of course, the Dome of the Rock, which you can see here. 
And the reason why I say that this one is the important one will be revealed here. You see here a picture of a 19th century archaeologist. Then there was no archaeology actually, but it was a kind of archaeology. Yes, a kind of archaeology. And you can see him here, this man, his name was Sir Charles Warren. You should know about this man, because after the great war he did in Jerusalem between 1867 and 1870, he was sent by the British government to mark the border between Canada and the United States, the 49 latitude. And the, the Americans were so grateful for him for pushing the border to the north, then there are two cities named after him. There is Warren, Michigan and Warren, Minnesota. Another great explorer of Jerusalem and of the country which the Canadians are happy with is Kitchener. I don't know if you know that Kitchener by profession was an archaeologist and he worked a lot in the country. At any rate, you see Charles Warren sitting here under what we call Wilson's Arch and you can see here two, two shafts. One shaft here, another, one shaft, uh, another shaft here. Warren did a very interesting thing. He excavated all around Jerusalem, he excavated shafts in order to go down to natural bedrock because all the rest is fields. He had to go through fields and to reach bedrock. The reason was that he knew that by reaching bedrock everywhere he will be able to learn about how did Jerusalem look before Jerusalem was founded and maybe from this conclude all kind of things. The result of his work is this one which you see a map of the Temple Mount, although this one is a German version of Warren, and I brought it here because Warren himself did everything in feet from the Mediterranean. Imagine he walked all the way from the Mediterranean to Jerusalem, and he came to the conclusion what is the height of Jerusalem and so on. A German scholar took Warren's map and translated them all, only Yekes can do it, translate all the dates into meters, and that's why this map is so important. Why did I bring it forth? Because I want to show you, I explained it actually in the first lecture, that the sanctity of Jerusalem starts with Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the source of sanctity of Jerusalem, and thanks to Charles Warren, who managed to make the topography, you can see here Mount Moriah, the summit of Mount Moriah is the Holy Rock, which is under the Dome of the Rock, you know, this mosque with the Golden Dome. You have to take it as an axiom, because I don't have time too much to explain why and where, but that's not a problem at all, that the, that the Holy Rock is the site of the Holy of Holies of the Temple. This, take it as an axiom, but I'll tell you a simple thing. In Judaism, unlike other religions of the time, they hire the Holy Year, and all the synagogues which we have are always at the highest place. There is only one exception of a synagogue, ancient synagogue, discovered in a village in the Galilee, Gush Halav, where the synagogue is down uh, in the valley, beside the other synagogue which is on the top. And we always say it was done maybe because of the profundis, from, uh, from, the, from the below I have called you, O God. But always the higher the, poor, the, the, the higher the holier. And when you read and you have got a good description of the temple in the Mishnah, for example, you can see that always you had to walk from the courts of the temple up to the Holy of Holies, all the time walking up. And that is why it is so important. Now, before I go on, just to show you, we've got here the Sedon Valley or Kedron Valley, the central valley of Jerusalem, and look what Herod did. It is very interesting. The valley does not follow, you see this is where the praying plaza is, in the middle of the praying plaza, in the middle of the praying plaza, it goes under the temple mount and comes out here. You understand? The same thing happens here. If this is Mount Moriah, you can see here is a valley, you can see it by the contours, and there is another valley which comes out here, and Herod went beyond the valley. In other words, and this will be basic in my lecture tonight, Herod the Great, in order to enlarge the Temple Mount, to enhance its dimensions, went beyond Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was already be, uh, occupied by a previous Temple Mount about which I will talk. In other words, beyond an ancient Temple Mount, pre-Herodian Temple Mount, Herod went beyond and extended it further. Some people believe that with the growth 
of the population of Jerusalem, whenever many of the pilgrims came on the three annual pilgrimages, you know, Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot, there was no place in Jerusalem. And there are many sayings such as, first of all, the inhabitants of Jerusalem had to give their homes or parts of their homes to the pilgrims and not to take money for it. Another thing, when you were standing, the city was congested, but when you bowed as respect to the Lord, suddenly there was space. And the third one is, never did a man say the place is too narrow for me in Jerusalem. <coughs> From all those sayings, you learned that indeed there was a problem of the pilgrims who come to Jerusalem, where to stay. And the belief is, one of our professors, Professor Mazar, who did all the excavations around the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount, he came to the conclusion that the reason why Herod the Great extended and enlarged the Temple Mount was in order to supply the porticos which surrounded the Temple Mount so that people will have where to stay overnight when they come on a pilgrimage. You see, we estimate, I said it last time, the number of people in Jerusalem in the Second Temple period was about 80,000. That's the maximum we can attribute to Jerusalem, which makes it a very big city. And Josephus Flavius says that at the beginning of the revolt, which was in Pesach, the number of the pilgrims in Jerusalem was one million. Even if he exaggerates by a lot, let us say quarter of a million, even that comparing to 80,000, which is the population, you understand that this is a very considerable number, which is very serious. It's a serious number, really, uh, to say. So this is actually what we have here, and this, the, the fact that Herod went beyond Mount Moriah will play an important, uh, important uh, role in my story tonight. So this is, as you see, the Dome of the Rock. The building itself is an amazingly, amazingly beautiful structure. But I will tell you something. You know, it, everybody connects it to Islam, but actually the builders, the plan, the decoration is all Christian. It is an imitation of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it is with the rotunda of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And at that time, the Byzantine builders, when they built it, they did something very interesting. They found it in our country, and you can find it only in our country in this way. All the holy places are surrounded by churches which are either round or octagonal. And this is a part of it. You see, it is called, we call it martyrium, doesn't matter. But all the churches of importance, like the Church of the Nativity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of Mount of Olives, the Church of... All, all the others, always. The holy place in the middle, and then octagon or, or a rotonda around. So this actually is a fulfillment of the Christian requirements. And if you tell it to a Muslim, he will kill you. <laughs> now, <laughs> this is the holy rock. This is the holy rock as seen from the top of the dome. And as you can see, it is incised in such a way that we don't really know how it was. Only because, only because in the Mishnah we've got a number of steps leading from the court all the way to the top, we know that it was higher than what we see here, and probably the shape which the Holy Rock received today is the result of the Crusader activities in Jerusalem in the Temple Mount, which made it into a church, and here on the rock was an altar flanked by two beautiful, beautiful candelabras, which are imitation of the Jewish candelabrum. By the way, I would like to tell you, if I mention that, the Jewish, the candelabrum in the temple, the menorah, was, had three legged, it had a, it was a tripod, three legs. Not as what you see in the Ark of Titus, which is, you know, which is full base, it's all wrong. The people who did it did not see the real menorah, which was stored, which was stored in, as Josephus Flavius tells us, and as we know, by a temple in, Jerusalem, in Rome which was named the Temple of Peace, from which it was robbed. It was robbed by the Vandals. And we know that it found its way to the capital of the Vandals, which was Carthage. All the stories which you hear about the menorah or other things in the Vatican are all nonsense, and I tell you directly from the horse's mouth. 
It's all nonsense. It's all nonsense. It was. It is not there. And I know that that one of our president, Mr. the famous Mr. Katza, when he went to Rome, met the Pope. He asked the Pope to to show him the menorah. Nonsense. The Pope even didn't know what he's talking about. Uh, yes, we know all the way. If the menorah is somewhere, it is in Jerusalem. You can ask me how. I will tell you. It's not part of my lecture, but still. When the Byzantines conquered Carthage, they took the menorah to Constantinople. And all the advisors of the emperor Justinian, and we know it from the official historian of Justinian, everybody told him, look, wherever this menorah is, it is a trouble. Jerusalem was destroyed, Rome was destroyed, Carthage was conquered, and if you leave it here, this is the end of it. So he didn't know what to do with it. He sent it to Jerusalem because he built, in today's Jewish quarter, the, one of the most famous churches of the time, a sister to the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, and he sent it there as a present for the consecration of the church. So it is under the Jewish quarter, and we never found it because of a simple reason. In order to find the menorah, we have got to be all just and pure. Try to think if we deserve it. <laughs> At any rate, you see, this is actually the story. So what you see here is actually the side of the Holy of Holies. In the framework, in the framework of Jerusalem, you can see the map of Jerusalem, the first wall, second wall, third wall, and the Temple Mount. And look well, in this place, I've marked the maximum area where the Mount Moriah can be included before Herod the Great. And if you see, here is a line. I don't know if you can see it. Here is a line which goes like this. Can you see inside the Temple Mount? Very, very important. And this again, I'm going to speak about it in a minute. First of all, the Temple Mount. And here you see, this is a reconstruction which we did in the Bible Land Museum in Jerusalem some years ago. And here you can see the Temple. But the interesting thing, which you, why did I bring it here? Not so much because to show the city, this I did in the first lecture, but I want to show you this wall and this wall here. What is it? In the book of Ezekiel, it tells us that the temple should be 500 cubits on 500 cubits. The idea of 500 cubits on 500 cubits temple mount is actually in the Mishnah. In tracted Midot, measurements, which is the description of the temple, it starts with the word, the temple mount was 500 cubits on 500 cubits. In order to solve problems, and soon you'll see why I tell it all in conjunction with the western wall. In order to solve the problem, let's say that the cubit is half a meter. So it will be 200 meters on 250 on 250. The problem is that the Western Wall, for example, is 488, almost double that size. So that is very interesting. It means that what the Mishnah is talking about is not the Temple Mount which you see today. Moreover, when Josephus Flavius, and to which I can also add another source of the time, which is the New Testament, the, the Gospels and Acts, which are more or less the time of Josephus Flavius, they also speak about a completely different Temple Mount. Nothing, you cannot compare the description of the Mishnah to the description of Josephus Flavius. Why? Because Josephus Flavius lived after Herod. Herod died in 4 BC, and uh, uh, Josephus Flavius was born probably around 30-35 AD. I told you the joke about AD, so I don't have problems to say it in spite of the fact I'm Jewish and lecturing to Jewish public. At any rate, at any rate, it is very interesting. And the question is, where did Ezekiel, and then not only the, the Mishnah, but also the Dead Sea Scrolls, always 500 cubits on 500 cubits. And the question is where it comes from. So when I did this model, which shows Solomon's temple, I thought maybe it is an older idea, and therefore I put this wall, which is 500 cubits, and this wall, which is 500 cubits, and I said, maybe it is already from the first temple period, but in, as I'm not so sure, I didn't put it in the south and in the west. I just put two corners as if to hint, maybe that is a possibility. We don't know, it was never discussed, and really we don't know where the 500 cubits or 500 cubits really originate, but anyhow, as I say, the oldest mention is Ezekiel. When I go on, you can see a good example of the story. 
This is actually a reconstruction of Ezekiel's temple, and one of the and one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is named the Temple Scroll, has got a very similar description. You can see a kind of a squarish temple mount, not like the one today, which is a rectangular or rather trapezoid, because every side of the temple mount today is different. The western is 488, the eastern 460, the north 320, and the south 290. You see nothing to do with anything, but it is so vast, and you know that this is the largest monument of the classical world, of the Greco-Roman -Greco world, and therefore you see this is square, has got 12 gates, why 12 gates? And 12 tribes that everyone, every tribe will have this gate. You see, this is the imagination of people, how they envisage the future temple which will be in Jerusalem after the famous war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. I don't know, you know that scroll in the Dead Sea Scroll. Very interesting. This is how they saw the future temple in Jerusalem. Now, another thing which is there, I want to show you the double gate. Uh, sorry, the, the gate, the uh, golden gate. Why do I want to show you? Because always, everybody, this is gate is built right in the corner of what could be the 500 cubits on 500 cubits. In other words, if you go from here, further here, this is the course of the valley which I showed you in the picture with the map. This is where the valley is coming out and you see that the eastern wall is still continuing further north. This is actually the monument which is, it's a Christian monument, nothing to do with us. It is on the axis of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I leave it aside, but what I wanted to show, I brought it here in order to show you that this is actually where the northeastern corner of a possible 500 cubits or 500 cubits is. And that's why it was chosen. What? What happens? It's okay? Good. Okay, so now look at that. Very important. The eastern wall of the Temple Mount unlike all the other walls, namely south, west, and north, is composed of different masonry, or I'll say it, of different periods. As you will see here, this is typical Herodian. This is typical Herodian, and you see that it is attached to older masonry. All the attempts to explain it, actually to this very day, are not convincing. The most probable, the most probable of all the suggestion is that we have here the southeastern corner of a fortress which was built in Jerusalem by the Greeks and it was actually the, one of the problems of Judas Maccabeus who could never conquer it. And only, remember, Judas was about 167 is when he purified the temple. This one was conquered 147, which means 20 years later, by Simeon, his brother. And it was a great holiday when this one was conquered. To this one, maybe it is that. We don't really know. No satisfactory proof was given that this is this fortress, which, by the way, was called the Chakra. I don't know, those of you who read Book of Maccabees, you know, especially for Hanukkah, you know, Chakra is mentioned many, many times. To, the, to this one, Herod the Great added his, you see, this is the Herodian part, and this goes for 32 meters to the southeastern corner of the Temple Mount. As we go to the southern wall, this one is the most important wall. Why is it most important? First of all, you can see here the remains of the fire of 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. You can see that the fire which the Romans did was so terrible that even the great stones of Herod were burned. It is unbelievable. The conflagration must have been really terrible. And you can see how the wall is destroyed. Here were shop, at, shops attached. And therefore you can see, for example, here and there you can see vaults, or actually the remains of arches which were there, because those shops, all the content of the shop was burned, and actually the ceiling of the shop, which had the shape of an arch, actually prevented the fire from going above, uh, above the ceiling. And therefore, uh, the upper part of the wall is well, uh, very well preserved. Now, this is the triple gate, which is one of the two southern gates of the temple. It was, it, today it is triple because in the, in the Muslim period, just at the eve of the Crusaders' arrival to Jerusalem, 
another gate was added to it, but altogether, originally, it is a double gate. And you can see here even the remains, you see, of a beautiful gate jump, a doorpost, really beautifully carved, typical Herodian, which is there. All the rest, of course, was destroyed later. Why do I speak about the southern wall? I'll tell you what. The interesting thing is that the southern wall was the most important wall to the Jews, I will say, till the Crusader period, which means till the 12th century AD, after the destruction of the temple, the Jewish attraction was the southern wall and not to the western wall. Very important fact, which is very important for me when I speak about the western wall. I want to show you, for example, that under the triple gate, which we have just seen, you see ancient stairwell leading up to the Temple Mount, which means even before Herod the Great, a special attention was given to the southern wall. And why the southern wall? Because the southern wall led to the city of David, which was the historical core, and where most of the population of Jerusalem lived in the, on the hill of the city of David, and on, on the both, both banks, or both slopes of the central valley of Jerusalem. So the easiest access was from the south, and not from the west. And therefore people used to, go, to come in the south. For example, you can see in the southern wall, you can see this enormous stairwell, which was built by Herod the Great, which leads into, into the Temple Mount. There is a gate, I'll show it to you immediately. And you can see the triple gate is far away in the extreme, it is further down. But look at the greatness of Herod's construction along the southern wall. Very important, very important. And what is more interesting is that we found here even an inscription which probably the only word to which we had any suggestion, it was the suggestion of Professor Mazar, that what we have here is a, the letter Kuf, you've got Nun, Yud, Mem, Zekinim, the elders. And why did he think of the elders? Because in the Mishnah he described the Rabban Gamliel, the most important first century rabbi in Jerusalem, was standing on the steps and speaking to the people, or teaching the people. Another thing which we have is that out of the three, again, again, the Mishnah, out of the three courts which were in Jerusalem, one was on the steps. And when you saw those steps, they must be the steps par excellence in Jerusalem. And therefore you see that somehow we are attracted to the southern wall. The western wall is, how, is not mentioned at all in the Mishnah, but the southern wall is. And how? Now, this is the most amazing thing. The, as I saw, as I told you, the triple gate was originally double gate, but most of it was destroyed in an earthquake which occurred in Jerusalem, actually the worst earthquake in the history of Jerusalem, which occurred in 1033. 1033, very important earthquake. And always when I say that, try to remember the date. 1033, you know the earthquake. 1066, I don't have to tell to anybody who knows the uh, British history. You see, William the Conqueror, and 1099, the conquest of Jerusalem by the Crusaders. You see, it makes everything very easy. Now, why do I bring it here? The, double, the other gate, which is still double to this very day, although blocked, is fantastic, because all the decoration which you see here, which is taken from, which is taken from a book written by a French scholar uh, in the middle of the 19th century, but you can see all the decoration, the capitals, the vaults, everything, even the domes which are decorated. You cannot see it so well. I think I've got the slide later on. The two gates, by mistake, are named the gates of Hulda, or Hulda gates. That's how you see. And the problem is that it is wrong, because Hulda gate is not mentioned in Josephus Flavius, but it is mentioned in the Mishnah. And the Mishnah speaks about it. The Mishnah, of course, described the 500 cubits of 500 cubits, a much smaller place. In other words, words the Hulda Gate must be found somewhere um, under the Temple Mount of today. You see? Very interesting. I'll speak about it later. This is so important, this gate. When the Muslims, and we have got... Ah, I have to remind you something. Remember that after the revolt of Bar Kokhva, Jews were not allowed to live in Jerusalem, and the prohibition on Jews living in Jerusalem continued till the Muslim conquest. 
When the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, they saw this beautiful, beautiful gate, which still retains to this very day many remains from Herod's time. Today it is difficult to visit because they made it into a mosque and you cannot, it is all covered with carpets and it is a mosque, they don't let people go in. At any rate, the interesting thing is that when the Muslims came, they saw this impressive gate, they started to say that this is the gate from which Muhammad came to his nocturnal flight to, Jew, to, to heaven in Jerusalem. You know, first of all to Jerusalem and from Jerusalem to heaven. At any rate, it, as you know, it is not mentioned at all in the Quran. Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran. It is a later story. It doesn't have to do anything with reality. But in Islam, where imagination plays such an important role, unfortunately, in everything, also this is there. At any rate, the interesting thing is that this gate played a very, very important role in Jewish life since the return of Jews to Jerusalem under the Muslims. Whereas the Muslims call it the gate of the prophet, yes, under Muhammad, who presumably or allegedly went through there, the Jews called it Shara Kohen, the gate of the Kohen. And it was so important that when Jews came to Jerusalem, imagine you are in pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the first thing which a Jew would do will go up to Mount of Olives. From Mount of Olives, he will see the entire platform. Those who have been to Jerusalem also have been. Or I hope they didn't ride the camel, but at least they saw, because there is always a camel which the tourists are going on. But you can see the Temple Mount, and this is, that's why it became so important. On the site where, unfortunately, the Jordanians built hotel, there was the place where the altar, where the red heifer was sacrificed. You see, very important. The Jews in the medieval era called it Hadom Leraglei Ha'el, which means the stool to the feet of the Lord, because it was so important. Probably there was something, a big stone or something, which we don't know, because we've got the description of the place. What I'm going to tell you, whenever I speak about from the Muslim period onward, the source for me to speak about it will be the Cairo Geniza. I hope that you know what the Cairo Geniza is. At any rate, this is extremely important because although so little of the Cairo Geniza was published, you know, this enormous pile of documents which were taken from the, the synagogue of Ben Ezra in Cairo and brought to England, where the University of, of Cambridge built a special building to house all those hundreds and thousands of documents, of which small part was this, uh, published till now. But the importance is immense, immense. Now, after a Jew went up to the Temple, to the Mount of Olives, where also they used, when they decided to excommunicate somebody, the declaration of the excommunication was there. They used to meet usually in Shmini Atzeret, you know, the last day of, of Sukkot. And there all the, the community's affairs were discussed and all kinds of things. Afterwards, a pil Jewish pilgrim will come down, and this is very important, will come down from the Temple Mount, from Mount of Olives, go to Shara Kohen, again Shara Kohen, this is the beginning, and walk around the Temple Mount, around the entire Temple Mount, Yes, and at each gate on the way, he will stop and say a prayer. The interesting thing is that the gates, the Jews had a name for every gate. And the interesting thing is that every gate, the prayer there, some of them are from the Siddur of Rosh Hashanah, but mostly it is prayers invented for the event of the pilgrimage, and if there is a gate named Gate of Yitzchak, they gave name Abraham, Yitzchak, Yehuda, and all those gates, always the prayer was connected with the name of the gate. Oh God, remember Abraham who sacrificed for you, namesake, was ready to sacrifice his son, have mercy upon us and let us see the temple rebuilt. You know, those kind of things. And each gate, we call the documents is called in Arabic Salawat el Abwab, which means the prayers at the gates. And this is a very important document. How do I know it is very important? 
because in the Cairo Geniza there are 10 copies of it, which means every Jew of Egypt who went to Jerusalem took the book with him to say the right prayer around and to give it back. But of all those 10, only one is intact from beginning to end, which helped me really to identify all the gates of the Temple Mount, how they were named in Hebrew in that period. And the interesting thing is they went counterclockwise, which means from this gate, who they call gate of, um, gate of uh, uh, the priest, Shara Kohen, but they were perplexed by the fact that the southern gate, so they believed they were the first one to make the mistake and called it triple gate and this gate called it Hulda gate. So they didn't know what to do with, how, how, if I call it the gate of the priest, how, where is Hulda here? So they call the gate of the exterior, they call it um, Kohen and the interior Hulda. You see, they found a kind of a way how to solve the problem which they had. But remember, this was really, uh, no, I say differently. What you understand now that in the Muslim period, the Jews preferred it, so to say, the southern wall above any other wall. The southern wall was the, shall I say, the favorite wall of the Jews. You see, very, very important. Now, when I go on, this is the way the, the passage of the gate looks. You see, this is only one side. There is a, it's double, there are two. The double is mentioned in the Mishnah. Remember that, that, that when so many people came to the Temple Mount, there was a problem of traffic. The street was congested. So they made order. You have to go from the right, the columns will be on your left, and you come out on the left, and then the columns in the middle will be on your right. The only ones who went counter, counter this agreement, which means they went from the left and came back to the right, there were people either were excommunicated, which you knew if somebody goes against the traffic, you should not talk to him, or somebody who was mourning somebody in the family died in the last year. You see, so ask what is there. And the interesting thing there is in the Mishnah, a deliberation, what should you say to each of those two kinds, to the excommunicated or to the mourning one? Very, very interesting. So we know that the, day, the reference will be to these gates because they are double. You understand? Very, very important. At any rate, when you go out, and this is so exciting, when you go out from this gate, you see there's a stairwell which comes out. Opposite there, you see the Dome of the Rock. You can see the Golden Dome. In the second temple period, and this is important, the height of the temple of the sanctuary was 100 cubits, about 50 meters. 50 meters will make it how many floors? It will make about 12, 13 floors high building. Amazing. I want to tell you that never before Herod the Great, the, the temple after it was destroyed, Solomon's temple was destroyed, it never reached that height. And when Herod the Great decided to build a temple, and Jews feared that he's going to or destroy the old one and to build a new one, he told them, look, what I'm going to do, I'm finally going to bring the temple to the original height, as is described in the Book of Kings, where Solomon is building the temple. So imagine a man coming from the Galilee, you know, after the days he walks, goes through this passage which we have just seen, and suddenly he comes out and he sees the glory of the temple. What impressive thing it could have been really to see the temple from the south. Now I'm going to tell you something else. You can ask me you, that, you can tell me, look, you were supposed to speak about the western wall. Why do you tell us about the southern wall? You see, I'll tell you why. Because one of the things which modern science is doing, at least those who deal with it, and I must tell you we are very few, mostly the people in the last, I will say, last decade who deal with it, is me and another rabbi who is a great, great scholar. Another, his, I'll tell you only one thing, his hobby is nuclear physics, so you can understand that this rabbi is not a, for, def, very difficult to fight against him. But the problem is, and this is exactly the story, why do I speak about the Southern Gate and others, is because of simple thing. Because of the sanctity of the Western Wall, 
This rabbi, his name is Rabbi Koren, Zalman Koren, really great scholar. He, as a religious person, cannot, cannot exclude the Western Wall Prem Plaza from the sanctity. You understand? It must be a part of the sanctity. What do I mean a part of the sanctity? The Mishnah, when the Mishnah describes, you remember that the Mishnah was compiled and signed in the year 200 by Yehuda Anasi. This is a fact. Which means it was 130 years after the destruction of the temple. So you can ask me a question. If the Mishnah says the Temple Mount is 50 cubits on uh, 200, uh, 500 cubits on 500 cubits, why when you Yudana C compiled the Mishnah and brought it to, to the end, why didn't he say the dimensions as we know today? Because he definitely knew the Herodian dimensions. Because of simple reason. As I told you, when Herod enlarged the Temple Mount, he went beyond Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah is a source of sanctity. All the Herodian edition was not considered holy, or maybe I won't say not considered, of reduced holiness, which means you did not have to keep so strictly the laws of purity. And I'll tell you more than that. Paul came to Jerusalem and went to the holiness with two Greeks. Everybody was furious, this is we know from the book of Acts, and told him, Go from here, you see, your people wanted to beat him, and take them to the place which is theirs. In other words, what part of the Temple Mount can be what we will call the Gentiles' court? Only the Herodian edition. Only the Herodian edition. You understand? And therefore, the Mishnah is not interested in, uh, the Mishnah, which is a book of law, is not interested in describing Jerusalem. What it is interested, when it speaks about the tract, it's um, the, uh, Midot, it wants to speak what area the laws of purity apply to. And this is only the 500 cubits and 500 cubits. The interesting thing, remember that the Mishnah is extremely, extremely, I will say, strict to the law. And as you probably know, Josephus Flavius tells us, that there, were, there was a kind of a screen which was made of stone in which inscriptions in Greek and Latin forbade the Gentile from trespassing beyond that line under the penalty of death. Josephus Flavius tells us the Mishnah does not mention it at all. So you could say maybe it is wrong, but two were found. One is in Istanbul and one is in the Israel Museum. Both of them are in Greek, although Josephus Flavius said that they were respectively Greek and Latin. So now you understand that on the Temple Mount, there were limits to which a Gentile could not pass. Where is it? Now, the fact that the Mishnah does not mention it, it is, and those inscriptions have got, I'll say, a legal um, uh, virtue, or I don't know how to say it. Because of simple thing, a gentile could come to Jerusalem, walk everywhere where he wants, but he could not go to the Temple Mount. When Herod enlarges it, that's a different story. He can go up to the Temple Mount, walk on the areas which Herod built, but he cannot walk to the others. So imagine he's going on the Temple Mount in this family, and he walks and suddenly somebody comes and uh, uh, chop off his head, because you cross to the holiness. So therefore, they had to put, only with the construction of the Herodian Temple Mount, they had to put this screen, or this wall, or whatever you call it, on which the inscriptions were forbidding transpassing. When Josephus Flavius tells us about those inscriptions, he described that there were other steps. That the wall was, you went up a step, and there was the wall forbidding transpassing. The fantastic thing is, if you look at this picture, you can see this picture was taken, you know that since the Crusader period, when Saladin conquered Jerusalem, no Christian was allowed on the Temple Mount. No Christian was allowed on the Temple Mount. The first Christian to go to the Temple Mount was the Prince of Wales, who was later King Edward VII. 
who went to the Temple Mount with a photographer, and the photographer took this picture, 1862, and you can see fantastic thing which for, uh, for us is a key. If you look here, you can see ancient steps which go all along, from here all the way. The picture is, uh, it should go further, and I know it should be go further because at one point, much further to the east, are remains of one step. All the rest was covered, rebuilt, you know, the Muslims were, are very active there, and that is how it is. You see, the photo is from the Ottoman period, and as much as the Muslims speak so highly of Jerusalem, look how everything is neglected. Look at the Dome of the Rock, how terrible it looks. At any rate, this is for me very important, because what we are trying to do, we are trying to limit the 500 cubits and 500 cubits. And now I'll stop and say another thing. When I speak about the 500 cubits on 500 cubits, you can ask me, who built it? Who built it? Because remember one thing, we know from the book of Ezra that when the Repetites came from Babylon and they built the temple in Jerusalem, which was consecrated in 515 BC, because you remember that the Cyrus declaration was 538, and therefore 13 years afterwards, the temple was consecrated. The older people who remember the temple as it was in the time of Solomon, the Solomonic temple, wept when they saw the poor substitute which was there. You see, very interesting. Now, there is another story. You know that Alexander the Great conquered our country in 333 BC. Year after, in 332, he reached Egypt and he founded Alexandria. When he founded Alexandria, and many Jews who lived in Egypt from before, we know about it, we've got documents and things, Jews came and settled in Alexandria. And a very important component of the population of Alexandria were Jews. The interesting thing is that the Jews immediately took important part in the spiritual life of Alexandria, which became the capital of the Hellenistic world. And we've got a lot of literature, Jewish literature from Alexandria, which you all know because many of the Apocrypha are actually written in Alexandria. For example, the book of, of, of Sirach, the famous book of Sirach, and the book of Maccabees. You see, all those were written in Alexandria. But for me, are two important books. One of them is a book which is called the Letter of Aristeas to Philocrates. What is the Letter of Aristeas? The letter tells us about Aristeas, we don't know even if he was Jewish or not, it's not clear, who was a minister in the court of Ptolemaeus Philadelphus, somewhere around 280 BC. And he, uh, the king sent him to Jerusalem to look for 70 sages who will come and translate the Bible to Greek. This is of course the Septuagint. When he comes to Jerusalem, he writes a letter to Philoctrates, who is his friend, back in Egypt. And one of the highest, uh, I will say, moments in his description, how he looks for those 70 sages, is a visit to the Temple Mount. And it is really, when he describes the Temple Mount, he speaks about an enormous Temple Mount, with an enormous wall of exceptional beauty. And he speaks about something fantastic. And remember what we know, that it was so poor that people wept. What, what is the story here? The answer is given in the book of Sirach. Because Sirach, remember, who built the temple of, by the repatriates of Babylon? Two people, Yoshua ben Yotzadak and Zerubbabel, the son of Chaltiel. I don't know if you remember, we'll open the Bible tonight at home, you'll find it. At any rate, the interesting thing is that in the book of Sirach, it tells us we'll be blessed Shimon ben Yochanan, a Kohen Gadol, the great priest, who built the temple exactly as Rubavel ben Shaltiel and Yoshua ben Yotzadak, and he founded the foundations, and he did, and did, and did, and brought water to the temple as well. The interesting thing is that when Aristarch describes the temple again, he speaks about the enormous walls and the beauty and so on, and when he goes out of the city, he hears noise of water in the middle of, of nowhere, so I ask people, what is that? So people tell me, tell him, put your ear on the ground and you'll hear the noise of water running. 
What is it they say? Ah, this is the water which is being brought to Jerusalem, to the temple. In other words, the two of them speak about two elements of the enormous walls and beauty and water supply to the Temple Mount. So what we can conclude, and there is no other way to do it, that the 500 cubits and 500 cubits surrounded by porticos, I know that it was surrounded by porticos, how do I know? Because when Herod the Great built the temple, the eastern portico of the temple, and I told you how the porticos are such an important thing, the eastern portico, Josephus Flavius tells us, and so does the New Testament, that the eastern portico was built by Solomon, because it was older than the others. So we know that the eastern wall of the Temple Mount, and I showed you this, what we call the seam, the difference of masonry on the eastern wall. We know that the eastern wall of the Temple Mount, this is agreed by all, the eastern wall of the Temple Mount of today is actually the eastern wall of this Temple Mount of 500 cubits on 500 cubits. In other words, Herod added to the Temple Mount from south, west, and north, but not from the east. You understand? Why? Because of the steepness. That's what Sephiroth Plavius, he doesn't know that we understand him better. And he tells that because of the steepness of the eastern wall, of the slope to the Kedon Valley, all the years they had to put fill and fill and fill and fill, and probably he refers now unknowingly to the 500 cubits and 500 cubits. In other words, if somebody wants to see the third temple to be rebuilt, this is the third temple. After which was Herod, which is the fourth. So what people who want to see the third temple have got to go to 300 BC. You see, the fourth, uh, actually, we had four temples. Solomon, the Patriots from Babylon, Hellenistic, and Herod. This is the history of the Temple Mount. So you see how important it is. Now, why do I speak about the Western Wall and I tell you all of that? Because Rabbi, uh, Rabbi um, 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 Koren, who is my opponent, we are good friends and we are fighting all the time about it. He, for him, and this is a problem, for him, since we all agree that the eastern wall is the eastern wall of the 500 cubits and 500 cubits, and I know because of other reasons that what is the size of a cubit, which is 44.6 centimeters, you understand that when I go from the east, I don't reach the western wall, I stop on the way. And between my western wall of the 500 cubits, on 500 cubits, and the western wall, there is about 30, 40 meters. Rabbi Koren does not agree, because as a, an observant Jew, the western wall must be holy. But it is not holy, because not only... Look, I want to tell you something. Go to all the people who are praying in the western wall. They will all tell you the Jews are praying there since the destruction of the temple. Nonsense. Nonsense. There are, I, this is not a problem to prove, as I'll show you when we reach... So finally, we'll reach the western wall. At any rate... The point is, the point is that he, in order to include the Western Wall, says that the cubit was 57 centimeters. The 57 centimeters cubit was in use, it's a Greek, uh, sorry, it's an Egyptian pharaonic cubit. You understand? Which prevailed in the first temple period. The secret is, and this I'll tell you that he doesn't hear, although he knows it very well, when Herod built his Temple Mount, he used Roman feet, which is 31.5, nothing to do with the cubits. You see, it's a completely different thing altogether. Good. Now, this is, of course, the inscription which forbids the Gentile from trespassing. This one is in Istanbul. You see, it is intact. The Jerusalem is only a fragment, but thanks to this one, it was easy to, it was easy to uh, reconstruct. You see, this is the Jerusalem one. It's beautiful. The Jerusalem one is much nicer. The letters are really beautiful, painted in red, beautiful really, as they are. Now, of the southern wall, what is left, if I want to know what a portico is, in the year 1927 there was a terrible earthquake in Jerusalem, and Aksa Mosque was destroyed actually. So the British rebuilt it and they excavated for foundation. That's why I brought you, remember the picture of the double gate, I brought 19th century. Why? Because when the British reinforced, in order to support it, they put many pillars of concrete, so to support the Aksa Mosque, which is above. And they found in the field underneath many, many 
capitals of various periods, but there are 10 capitals like this one, which is fantastic. I don't know if you can see from distance, I don't see it from here now. You see there is a kind of a pinkish color in places. I don't know if you can see, you don't see. It. And Josephus Flavius tells us that the, portic the columns of the porticos had capitals which were all gold. When you go, in spite of the fact that since 1944, when they finished to do, it is standing in the rain, in the sun, all those ten capitals, you can still see pieces of gold. People don't believe me. You can still see, you go up there when I take people to the Temple Mount, I always show them, I think I've got a detailed one, I'm not so sure, no, I don't have. At any rate, it is fantastic, because you can see and you can understand why Josephus Flavius is speaking about gold. The gold is still there. Imagine, since 44, it is standing in the rain and in the wind and everything, <coughs> and you can still see the gold in it. This is the continuation of the, uh, of the southern wall, which now you understand is so important. You can see the Crusader Palace of the Templars, you can see all the Arab reconstructions and so on. But finally, finally, we go to the western wall. Now, the Western Wall is definitely very exciting, but remember one thing, it has got nothing to do with the sanctity of the Temple Mount. And I want to tell you, it is a bit of politics, but it is important. Many of the rabbis in Israel understand that you can go to the Temple Mount, because what is the problem? Everybody is asking, whenever I meet Jewish crowd, why did the Israeli government give up all the Temple Mount to the Muslims. Because after all, it is holy also to the Jews. And look, like in the cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron, there are hours for the Jews, hours to the Muslims, places allotted to the Muslims, places allotted to the Jews, and finally, after thousands of years, Jews are able to go freely to pray on the, temple, uh, on the cave of the Patriarchs. Why not on the Temple Mount? Because of the stupid rabbis. Because what happened, what happened in 67, I remember I was witness to it, Immediately, I, I went to, to see the Kotel was liberated in 67 on Wednesday. I went immediately to the Kotel. As a Jewish person, I was in Jerusalem, I was in the army, they gave me two hours free. I went to, to the Kotel. I came there, I hitchhiked. And who took me in the hitchhike? Ben-Gurion. He went exactly in the same time to see. And I saw when they hacked the, the, the Jordanian sign, uh, street sign, which was there on it. At any rate, the rabbis immediately put an inscription, Jews are not allowed to go to the Temple Mount. So Dayan, for him, it was simple. If not allowed, why to create friction to the Muslims? Give it to the Muslims, and that's it. And so we lost it for another thousand years. Very simple. Because they knew exactly as we know. The sanctity of the Temple Mount is limited to 500 cubits on 500 cubits. What I've done, you can see I showed you the southern one through the steps. And there is a western. And there is a northern one, which I'll show you, I'll explain to you later, how do we know. Today we know if we don't, if we give up the sanctity of the Western wall, which is not holy at all, it is not. You see, when you ask people there from the second, no. The Western wall, the first time when we hear about Jews praying there in a general prayer, you know when? 1655, 17th century, not before. It is amazing how such a place became so deep-rooted in our hearts. And the clever ones come to me when they walk there, you know, and they say, leave it alone, this Western world. The important thing is on the Temple Mount. So you see the inspection. More and more rabbis allow their disciples, allow their disciples to go up to the Temple Mount, and you can see them as Diane arranged. Every one of them is accompanied by an Israeli policeman and an Arab, the wardens of the Temple Mount, and he follows that he will not be able to read, he will not be able to pray, he will not be able to do anything. But the point is, all those come with shoes, which are not, of course, not leather, they go to the mikveh the night before, and you can see them already walking on the Temple Mount. Some, some rabbis understand the importance of a visit to the Temple Mount. And this is actually the problem today, that because of then they said not to go up to the Temple Mount, that's how we lost it. You understand? That is the situation. We know very well. And as I tell you, why do I say in such a, how confidence 1655? 
because of simple thing, and I'll tell you what it is. You know that when you come to the, thank you, you come to Jerusalem, you walk along the tunnel. The western wall is covered by houses, right? The western wall praying plaza was also covered by houses. It was all covered, and how do I know? If you look at the western wall, you'll see that at a certain level, you see niches in the wall, carved into the Herodian stone. What is that? This was done by the Muslims in order to put arches on which buildings were built, exactly like along the rest of the wall. You understand? In the year 1546, there was a terrible earthquake in Jerusalem. And this, this earthquake did a kind of a, like a knife, like this, severed and destroyed houses along the western wall. One of them is the mosque which is on top of the Temple Mount, and those who have been to Jerusalem, I don't know if you remember, there are two enormous cypresses growing. I don't know, on the Temple Mount, I don't know if you have noticed it. These are growing over the ruins of the mosque. The western wall was exposed, 16, as I say, 1546, and further to the north, few mosques were destroyed. You see, it, was, it went just along the western wall. The point is that when, before the Western Wall was exposed, or immediately after, the Jews used to go to one corner, which was an end of a lane, which reached the Western Wall, and it was after the prayer in the synagogue, on Sabbath, people used to go individually, not everyone, here one, there one, that's what we hear from documents, description of the Christians, and so on. They used to go, and pray by the wall, individual. And the first time that we hear about a community praying there is by a Christian pilgrim in 1655. First time. Now, why is it important? It is important to say because everybody knows there is a saying which everybody repeats, Meolam lo zaza shechina mikotel maravi. Never did the, the, the high providence leave the western wall. This is not in the Mishnah, this is a Midrash. And this Midrash is from the 4th century. And I think I know exactly why the 4th century suddenly they said it. First of all, the western wall of the Temple, not the Temple Mount, was the holiest because this one is the only one which the inside is the Holy of Holies. You understand? From all the other are the courts. From this side, the Holy of Holies. And I think it is connected with Julian, the apostate. Because we have got description, non-Jewish description, because I need always objective, who describe how the Jews, when they decided to go as Julian wanted to rebuild the temple, the first thing they did, they started to destroy the remains which were on the Temple Mount. Some people believe that it was a pagan temple, but today most of the scholars believe the, the, the pagan temple which was built after the destruction of the Jewish temple was built some, somewhere else, where the site of the Holy Sepulchre is today, not on the Temple Mount. In other words, what I want to say, when they started to destroy the foundation of the wall, of the walls of the Temple Mount, they knew that in spite of the fact we are destroying it, never did the Shechina leave the, whole, the, the Western Wall. And this is what the Jews used all the time. When we had the quarrels with the Muslims after the riots in 1929, when there was an international committee which the League of Nations imposed on the British to do inquiry committee, to whom does the Western Wall belong? The Arabs brought all the stories of the pilgrims and all that. What did the Jews bring? The same sentence all the time, Meolam lo zaza shechina mikotel ma'aravi. You see, that, that was the only excuse. That's, actually, this is the source of sanctity of the Western Wall, a midrash from the 4th century. You understand? And after the fall of all the buildings along the Western Wall, and it was very impressive because the Western Wall is impressive, the Jews choose it to, to pray. And again, they say something very interesting. They went to pray against Midrash Shlomo, let's say, the school of Solomon, which is what is the reference to Aksa Mosque, not so much to the Dome of the Law. But I know why they were attracted to this one. This is what we are going to see now in the Western Wall. So this is the southern part. You can see Robinson Arch. This is a reconstruction of the Western Wall, which is a good one. It shows you some of the gates. This enormous stairwell, which was discovered by the excavations, its foundations, 
going all to this gate here. This is the so-called Barclays Gate, which is today a part of the lintel. Enormous lintel can be seen in the women's, uh, in the women's section. Then you have got Wilson's Arch. You saw how Warren was sitting under that arch. And there is another arch further to the north called Warren's Gate, which, of course, we'll speak about it a lot. At any rate, this is how the corner is of the Temple Mount. I want only to show you here, very important is this man. Opa. You see this man sitting here? This is the trumpeter which you, who used to, to declare the Sabbath Friday afternoon and the end of Sabbath Saturday evening. Very important, we know about it. You see, when there is, there is. The Mishnah mentions him, Josephus Flavius mentions him, and even in the inscription was found. You see where in the corner, where you can see beautifully, you can see, oh no, I'm sorry, where you can see beautifully the inscription here, to the place of trumpeting to separate. Very important. So you see, why is it important? Because this was a legal thing, so you've got it in the Mishnah, you've got it in Josephus Flavius, and now we know where the trumpeter was standing. Without this inscription, we didn't know. We knew that there was one in Jerusalem, we didn't know where. Unfortunately, the inscription is broken, and I'll tell you who broke it. Warren broke it. Why? When he excavated this shaft, his shaft, he did, the, the stone was upside down. He didn't see it, and he broke it in order to go further deep, and he destroyed it. Poor Warren. Had he known, he would have regretted it, I'm quite sure. At any rate, when we go further, you can see again the Western Wall, the southern section. And when we go further, you see, we can see, this is Barclays Gate. This is the women's side, and you can see this enormous lintel, which occupies two courses of the Western Wall, which means it is about 2 meters 20 high, and you see the feel of the gate, you can see it here. Today, the inside of the gate, which is also a long passage like the one you have seen there, is used, part of it is a cistern, and part of it is a little mosque which is called in Arabic El Burak, because the Jews, sorry, the Muslims, in order to, to annoy the Jews, what did they do? They said that uh, the Western Wall, the Kotel, is also holy to them. Why? Because this is where Muhammad harnessed his mare, horse, whatever you call this creature, when he came in his nocturnal flight, and that's why in Arabic it is called Al Burak, which means this is the name of this uh, mare which uh, the legendary, you know, it has got, you see, everything in the Quran is full of reality. It has a face of a woman, wings of an animal, and body of a horse. And it flies like the lightning. Very logical, like everything else in the Quran. At any rate, at any rate, this is very, very interesting. This is the gate which you see there. Now, this is Wilson's Arch. Uh, the discussion between me and the archaeologists who came after me, because unfortunately, because of age, I had to retire, you cannot fight nature. And they say that this is Roman. No, it is early Muslims. Because the Muslims needed the Temple Mount, when they made it a holy place, they needed to come there for prayer, and they needed also to ablution. Because they learned from the Jews the habit of ablution, and therefore they had to bring to the Temple Mount water in order to make pools and cisterns and so on. So they built this arch, I mean rebuilt, because this arch originally is Herodian. And I found two arches of the Herodian bridge I found. It is there. It is there. And they renovated it in order to enable really the bringing of water into the Temple Mount. Now, this is the reconstruction of the Western Wall where we have excavated. You can see at the top, again, Wilson's Arch. The men who are standing there could be two. Either a Jew from the Second Temple period looking down at the Herodian Street. You see how deep it is? Or modern Jew look, looks at the praying plaza of the men, which is inside there. Here is this fantastic Herodian Hall, which we have. And really, it is, uh, these excavations are really amazing. And look. At Herod the Great, when you stand to then pray, count how many layers there are, you'll see 18 layers. It is amazing. It is about 20, 22 meters deep, till you reach bedrock. This is, this is bedrock here. It's really amazing. There is no other structure which can compete with the beauty and the greatness of the place. This is a reconstruction of the Western Wall. The white part is the Western Wall today. Unfortunately, you cannot see those 
those pilasters. Why? Be it is exactly like the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron. Because these are always only where you see the western wall or the walls are comprising of two sections. One of them, when it is a retaining wall to a field, the level of the Temple Mount platform, the area is here, and all when it was freestanding, it was with those pilasters. On top, you can see the sanctuary itself, you see very white. The Mishnah is telling us that the, the temple was as white as the snows of Lebanon. And the interesting thing, there is a Jewish habit, I've seen it, for example, in Tunisia. Jews before Pesach still paint, you say, the houses white, because also the temple before Pesach was always painted white. Beautiful, this habit is still existing somewhere. This is, of course, Wilson's Arch. And when we go further, look at this enormous stone which you see here. There is nowhere in the world where, in the Herodian period, such a big stone. As a matter of fact, I wanted to tell you, you see this man is standing at the end. It is, this is uh, 1360 meters long, 3.3 meters high, and it is uh, deep 4.6 meters. It weighs 600 metric tons. 600 metric tons, if you don't know what it is. Five enormous lorries, at least five enormous lorries with trailer behind pulling will have to carry such a stone. Israel is always, you see, we are very poor in, in Olympic Games, we always get nothing. So, they also here, the gold medal deserves Egypt, where it has got the famous statue of Ramses II, the so-called Osimandias, on which Shelley wrote the famous poem. The second, the silver is going to Lebanon, the temple of Jupiter and Baalbek, and we've got only the third one. Okay, so we've got bronze medal. I'm happy with this as well. At any rate, really a fantastic wall, but it shows you the greatness of the Temple Mount. It is really, you can't imagine. I told you that my permanent joke is that there were, you know, everybody knows about the seven marvels of the, of the ancient world. I said there were nine. The ninth was, why didn't the Temple Mount become the eighth? Because it is so much larger than any other monument. No other. The greatest similarity is the Hill of Palatine in Rome, but you cannot compare. Yes, this is Warren's Gate. I couldn't take a good picture because it is, the tunnel is very narrow, but this is Warren's Gate. You remember I told you about the prayers of the gates. In the prayers of the gate, it is called the Gate of Judah. But the inter nobody called it the Gate of Judah. Everybody called it the cave because it is subterranean. When you go to the Temple Mount, you have to go up. Why is it so important? Because this is due west from the Holy of Holies, from the Dome of the Rock today. You understand? And therefore, the Jews, when they were allowed, when the Muslims came, they allowed the Jews to go and to, to pray in the Temple Mount. But then happened something. In the year 716, after years when the Jews used to pray on the Temple Mount, clean it and do all kinds of things, in Pesach they drank wine. And for the Muslims, it was so terrible, they threw them out of the Temple Mount. And the Jews lost, lost the Temple Mount again. But the Muslims were kind enough and allowed them to pray. At any gate they choose, they choose this gate because it is the closest to the Holy of Holies. You understand? How do I know that the gate of Judah in the prayers of the gate is the cave? Because there is a very interesting thing. Amongst the letters which we have in the Cairo Geniza, there is a letter which is sent to one of the heads of the community of Egypt who came on a visit to the country. The main yeshiva in Jerusalem, in the country, in the early Muslim period, was in Ramleh. Because Ramleh was the capital of the country, founded by the Muslims, the only place in the country founded by the Muslims to make the capital, because they didn't want Jerusalem. I'm telling you, Jerusalem is not important. Jerusalem was important in the Islamic story only twice under the Crusaders and under Israel. When they don't have it, suddenly Jerusalem is important. You see? It's a fact. Seeing 19 years of Jerusalem under Jordan, you know, from 48 to 67, not one single prime minister, president, or king came to visit it even. It was not important. The contrary, King Hussein took everything he could to Amman. You see? At any rate, the interesting thing, a, a very important head of the community, from Egypt is coming to Jerusalem, to, 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 to Ramle, and they suddenly they sent to him a letter. This is what he understands. There are problems in the community in Egypt. Come quickly back. 
So his letter, his letter was found. He says, I got your letter. I understand the emergency. I'm going quickly to Jerusalem to pray at Judah's gate, and I'm going back to you. Why Judah's gate? Because this was the most important, a place of prayer, and you have to take one plus one, and to understand that this is Judah's gate. The interesting thing is that we know that the end of the story came under the Crusaders, when they blocked the wall, which you see here, and they made, the Muslim made the whole thing, the Crusader made the whole thing into a system, which exists to this very day. This is the way it looks. But if you look at it, you see the enormity of the Herodian dimensions. You see, it is, look at the man standing there. I don't know if you can see a man standing there. The picture is bad. It was taken by, by journal, journalists. I don't know who even in 81 when there were riots again around it. So that's what is taken. But if you see this man here, imagine all this passage was a synagogue. Now, further to the north, the only place where Warren found that actually the wall has got also those, you see those, um, how shall I say, those pilasters, and you see this oblique line between the pilasters. It's exactly like what the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron, also built by Herod the Great. This is how the western wall looked when the temple was there. Look at the height. Here it is, the original height is still preserved. It is really amazing. It is amazing beauty as the Temple Mount was then. In other words, what we can learn from the whole thing, this is the northern part, you see a northwestern part of the Temple Mount, you can see it here. Actually, today we know, thanks to our excavations, that the western wall, which was built by Herod the Great, reaches as far as here, and all that was not, it was not built by Herod. He simply died and it never worked. We always believed that the entire Temple Mount was built by Herod the Great. But the interesting thing is that after he died, the work still continued. How do we know? Herod started to build the Temple Mount in 22 BC. This is according to Josephus Flavius. In both of his books, we reach 22 BC. He died in 4 BC. And he didn't finish to dig. How do I know? Because Jesus came to Jerusalem in 20, 26 AD and he says something to the Jews. You know, he said his famous saying, I can build the Temple Mount and destroy it in three days. So the Jews tell him, how dare you say such a thing? We are already working 46 years and we are still have got work. And we know that the Jews who always tried not to keep money in the treasure of the temple from one year to the other. So there won't be accumulation. Remember that every Jew had to pay half a silver shekel. And the problem was they knew that if they do a lot of money, it will be temptation for the Romans. And therefore, all those who worked in the temple, even if they worked one hour a day, they received a salary of a whole day. The idea was to spend and spend, like all the ministries do today, I don't have to tell you, because otherwise they will not get the same budget next year. The interesting thing, that the treasure was so great when the Romans conquered the city, that with the money which they found in the temple, what did they do? They built the Colosseum in Rome. And I'm not joking, I'm serious. We've got an inscription, the little of the, muse of, of the Colosseum, which is published in all the scientific books, Always, this structure was built by the money which the emperors, Vespasian and Titus, took in the war which they had. The only war they had was the war against Judah. You understand? So I tell my Italian friends, Jewish slaves build it, we pay for it, we take it back to Jerusalem. <laughs> you think this is, uh, this is the northern wall, also you see all quarried in the rock, I don't know if you can see it is coated, but you can see everywhere still rock is there. Really great work made by Herod the Great. And the greatness of the Temple Mount is reflected in this one. This was a drawing which was made by a French, by a French, uh, Marquis de Vauguer was his name. And this was the imagination of the Temple Mount. You ask me, is it true? There are many things to be corrected. But the general impression of the greatness of the Temple Mount is there. The point which I want to stress again is the following one. The Western world became in Judaism a very important thing. But we have to take it not only with the heart, but also with the brain. Always brain is good. You see, you see 
be clever, not just clever. So you see what is happening here. It is only from 1655 that the Western world plays an important role, and therefore it should not be taken in the consideration of how the pre-Herodian Temple Mount was, you know, what I call the third temple was. The fourth one is there, and those who want, maybe one day we'll see the fifth one. Thank you very much.